there you are. You've spoken with the survivors. Indeed. We thought to share what we have gleaned, that we might together gain a greater understanding of present circumstances. Fortuitous timing. Alize and I completed our own investigations not long ago. Then we should take a moment to compare notes. Shall we begin with the two of you? So the merchant Karzal was gravely concerned about his business in the days preceding his untimely end. The tales we heard were much the same. The first victims to be changed into blasphemies were all overcome with anguish of one manner or another. Then those who saw their loved ones stolen before their eyes succumbed to a similar panic setting in motion a chain of transformations. Fear, unease, despair. These negative feelings serve as a catalyst. If so, then it is not unlike the calamity that befell the ancients. With their creation magics, they unwittingly gave form to untold horrors. Had they simply lost control, Surely it would have manifested in many forms, not all of them monstrous. Yet somehow, this phenomenon is triggered solely by the darkness in their hearts, a common thread with what we now witness. Common, but not identical. While the beasts the ancients faced were forged with magic alone, those of today are born of sentient beings. Why remains to be seen, but there is one fundamental difference between us and our predecessors. Our souls are sundered, whereas theirs were not. Perhaps that single variable makes all the difference. If I may, there was another detail that troubled me. We have it on good authority that Karl Zahl's transformation took place before the skies began to burn. What? If that's true, then the situation's more dire than we realized. It means even if there's no ominous sign presaging the final days, anyone, anywhere, has the potential to become a beast. Even in lands we thought safe, even as we speak. Look! It's the Sartrap! The Sartrap! Thank the heavens! My countrymen, I am relieved and heartened to see you strong and safe. While the danger has not yet passed, far from it, allow me to assure you that the beasts that raged within the city walls have been exterminated to the last. Outside this sanctuary, the brave men and women of the Radiant Host and our dragon ally continue to battle our unholy foes. I pray these tidings put your minds at ease and help you calm your hearts. Have faith that we shall soon conquer this terrible trial. Your Excellency, is there any word from Palaka's stand? My grandson was bound for there yesterday and I, I worry for his life. We are still awaiting a report, but I promise you, as soon as I have ought to share, Your... Your Excellency, 
I bring grave news. You are? I, I'm Matsya of, of Akali, a humble fisherman. Ah, I remember you from our first visit. Uh huh? Wait, you're. But. But no, that can wait. When the skies turned red, I set off for Balakistan, fearing for the safety of a friend. But as I drew near the village, I saw dreadful beasts all about. No! God have mercy! Your Excellency! Save my grandson, I beg of you! We will spare no effort to save all we can, but you must remain calm. Calm? You tell me to be calm? You saw those beasts? They tore our bravest warriors limb from limb! What if we are too late, huh? Did they catch him? Stick their fangs into him? The fangs! Oh. <laughs> Get away from her! Now! before it spreads. We'll handle this. See the townspeople to safety. Run! As fast as you can! sake and your own.
Be strong, my friends! Fear not, for we will defeat these abominations! Brave men and women of the Radiant Host, lend your Stola and Thancred your aid. Let not a single beast escape. The rest of you, flee this place. Carry the wounded if you must. Head indoors or underground. Above all, stay calm. No beast will follow you. We will see to that. Alphano! Alize! Leave the city to us! And make for Palakas stand at once! Matya, show my friends to the village! I promise you, they're more capable than the host's finest! Right! Go with them, will you? We will save these people, as many as we can. No more enemies to trouble us here. It's me. How fair you below. Understood. I will inform Vritra. Chaos and panic sweep Ras at Han. And many more have succumbed to the transformations. Amidst the fray, Ahawan fell, protecting a grief-stricken father. <sighs> My friends fight alongside your radiant host to secure the capital. Beasts have been sighted in Palakistan stand as well. We have divided our forces in hopes of quelling the threat there. Of small solace is that we now know what triggers the transformation, as my companions tell it. So it is the very fear and despair in their hearts which inflicts this abhorrent punishment upon them. A nightmare from which my children will never awake. O oh, capricious and cruel fate, they are undeserving of such condemnation. Will you wallow in sorrow or rise to the occasion? Razat Han is leaderless. Before he passed, Ahawan sought to reveal the truth to his people. Honor his wishes. To what end? To breed a new conflict between dragon and man? These claws could reduce thee to shreds with a touch. These jaws crush thy bones to dust. Only through my proxy could I walk with my children. Without him, I am a bringer of fear. No different from the beasts which beleaguer them. Perhaps so. Only in death were Hreisvelger and Shiva united. Indeed, whenever man and dragon have come together, death has ever been the inevitable result. It was our fear of your kind that sparked a nigh endless war. Fear and hate of which Nidhogg drank deep as he laid waste to my homeland. And in turn, I took my revenge on his brood. Blood for blood, pain for pain. I thought nothing of theirs, only of mine. And 
yet. Were the chasm between us too vast and too deep, Kreisvelga would not have borne his sail to battle and our rescue. He would never have entrusted a mortal champion with one of his eyes, and the Dragonsong War would still rage on. And I would still wage a never-ending war of violence and vengeance. The future of our star be damned. I cannot speak for Ahuan's greater goals. Yet I know that he served you, served your people, long and true. In this time of unprecedented crisis, he turned to you. You could do worse than to place your trust in him. It will not be easy, but the future of Radzid Han hangs in the balance. We have company. Come, Vritra! It's all or nothing! Courage, friend. The pain will pass. Has anyone seen Mevan? Could she be? We've dealt with all the blasphemies and made certain no villagers are still in hiding. Good work. We've otherwise tended to the wounded as best we can. What will become of us? Hope is on the way, surely. We may have to abandon our homes now, but we will return, someday. But where can we go? Is anywhere even safe? That I cannot say. Well, I can. Nowhere's safe. Run all you like, but there's no escape in these things. And even if I could... <laughs> It's too late for my family. <laughs> this isn't good. The more they dwell on the tragedy, the more likely we are to lose them too. My friends, this, this is a place of worship. Should your heart quake with sadness, cast your mind to the heavens and remember. Remember the teachings of the old gods. Did they not implore us to stand fast when waves of sorrow break against our shores? Know this, my children. There is more ugliness than beauty in this world. To live is to suffer. To drink of calamity and drown in anguish. To toil and be tested, always and ever. Tis a perilous path you walk. Death lurks in the dark and is the sole promise that awaits at journey's end. You will tremble with terror. You will weep tears of anger and despair. But do not avert your eyes. See your life for what it is. Then 
you see how the hardships make you strong. Every doubt reforged as scales for your armor. Every agony to temper your blade. Thank you, lad. We'd almost forgotten who we are. My undying gratitude to you as well, my friends. You were searching for Mevan, no? We must return home. I pray you help the boy find his friend. Gladly. We dispatched what beasts we could, but the roads are still dangerous. Stay together and go in safety. That was very impressive, what you did back there. Those words seemed to resonate with your people. They should. They were the first spoken unto our ancestors by the divinity of legend. I'm easily upset, and fish are wont to flee a temperamental hand, so I recite the teachings over and over to calm myself. They're lovely and inspiring to hear, though I imagine they were born of great misfortune. They are born of life. There's as much bad as good in it. More, many would attest. All the more reason to appreciate the good when you can. I won't argue with that. In darkness, seek joy. Surrender not to sadness and see beyond despair. Walk free, and bear the light for others to follow. And with that, let us see if we can't find Mervyn. Did you see? That beast was chasing someone. She's so cold, Elphino. 
The child is alert, and I see no wounds, and yet... <sighs> she grows weaker. My spells can do no more. What she needs is a change of clothes and a warm bed. We must hurry back. Not now! Matsya, take the child! It appears we've made enough noise to be heard for miles around. More will be upon us ere long. We make our stand here. Matya, can you take her back to the village? But the child? All, all by myself? You can't be serious! The beasts will follow you home unless we stop them here. And so we shall. Be strong, Matsya. Her life is in your hands. Right. I... I can do it. I know you can. We'll keep them busy, Matsya. Go! Quickly! what it is. See how the hardships make you strong. Every doubt reforged. Every agony. <sighs> Divinity? Nay, but one who would deliver thee just the same. Please, you must save the child. She is all that remains of Mevan and Grasif. Please. Well, well. Seems the babe's taken a liking to you. our friends as we flew in. They appeared to be holding their own against the Horde.
Right. That's the last of them. We should hurry and find Matsya. What, like divine aid? A fine battle it must have been. Shame I missed it. Estinian, it was you who came to Matia's aid. I was only along for the ride. Vritra was the one who saw the boy was in need. The two are headed back to the village. Where the worm will honor Ahiwan's wishes and finally reveal himself to his people. Perhaps so. Will you go and join them? There's something I need to do first. Mervyn gave her life so that her child might live. She deserves better than to be left to drift alone. She deserves to be laid to rest beside her husband at least. Will you help me? Look, someone's coming. People of Razathan, it warms my heart to see so many brave, resilient souls before me. Today, I would share with you a great revelation. But before I do, I must make a humble request. Do not be alarmed, nor avert your eyes. See the one I unveil for who he is, and know that he means you no harm. Very well. I dare say it can't be worse than the horrors we've already seen. Many thanks. People of Radzathan, I am Vritra, and for years uncounted hath this isle served as mine abode. Tis as the Satrap's ally I am known. Today, I would reveal the truth unto you. Let us hope they accept him. If I am hearing this right, you were the satrap all along? Vashon! I mean... Master Vitra... The, the, does your divine eye really see all? Nay, child. While my eye hath borne witness to the whole of our nation's history, to its future I am blind as thee. Which we have never known 
is come to Fafnir, our home. Friends and loved ones have been taken from us. I, too, have lost my closest confidant. Ahawan loved this land and served it with dignity till his dying breath. A nobler satrap there will never be. For so long, I lacked the courage to face you. I will not easily earn your trust. This I know. And yet, I cannot sit idly by and abandon rugs that harm to her fate. A font of boundless vibrancy, this jewel of the ocean. Since time immemorial, has she glittered with every color imaginable. To this dragon, slumbering in his dark lair, was a mesmerizing sight, and one that brought no end of joy to my heart. This calamity has stolen too much from you already, yet so long as you live, the light of Radzat Han will never be extinguished. I pray you let me watch over it, over you, and lend me your strength that we might face this trial and those to come as one. I do not know you, Dragon, but I thank you for speaking the truth to us. As divinities, both Manusha and Riga once joined together, so too do I believe that hand in hand, we can overcome this ordeal and welcome an era of peace. A sight that would have surely brought a smile to Izael's face. Indeed. Excuse me, but I must speak with the Sartrap at once. Father! You have suffered dearly of late, yet you must endeavor to look beyond these losses to the future you yet have. On behalf of the Forum of Charlian, I come with a proposal by which you, the people of Radzat Han, might be saved. I say again, I must speak with your satrap. I beseech you, take me to him with all possible haste. I am Satrap here. Speak thy proposal. All present shall hear and judge. If I have given offense, then I apologize. First, allow me to share with you what knowledge we have of the phenomenon responsible for your woes. The final days. It is an affliction of stagnancy and rot, sown into the currents of the star. Though the first prominent manifestation was here, in Thavnir, it will invariably spread to every corner of the world. The Forum was forewarned of this apocalypse several centuries ago. Thenceforth, my predecessors sought to prepare for the end times in the only conceivable fashion, by securing a means of escape. Escape the store? 
What madness is this? Tis by no means madness. With the coming of the seventh umbral calamity, the true nature of the Red Moon, Dalamud, was revealed. That it was an artificial construct of ancient Alag. But what of the Silver Moon? This celestial satellite is yet another technological marvel fashioned and maintained by ancient allies. A ship that will sail the heavens and deliver our people from destruction. And by our people, I speak not only of Charlian. We mean to save every man, woman, and child it is within our power to save. Including you, our dear friends of Radzat Han. Recent events necessitate adjustments be made, and quickly, but we can and will escort you safely to the moon. Long has thy forum been allies to Thavnir. I trust thou dost not extend this offer lightly. Yet I wonder, is this truly the way? Is there a future to be built for us beyond this star? Our father deemed the last bastion of hope. It is for that very reason I come before you and your people. To answer any and all of your questions. To offer my assurances and allay your fears. Though, if you wish the best for your people, I advise you to render your decision swiftly. Show our friends to Megadota. They are to be received as honored guests. decision is reached, your paths shall be yours to decide. Until then, heed the warning of these brave heroes. Guard your hearts against fear and despair, for it is within such fertile soil that the seeds of blasphemy find purchase. Master Vitra, we believe in you. Oh, you're still here. What a relief. Nidana, what's the matter? Has something happened at Palika's stand? Oh, no, not that I know of. I just hope to hear your thoughts on a theory of mine. All who undergo the transformation are drained of their ether, yes? What is it then that gives these beasts the strength to carry on as they do? Logically, they must be drawing upon an alternate form of vital energy. That put me in mind of our earlier conversation, when I tried to explain the essence which many confuse with Ether. Akasha. Yes, I remember. The unseen gift bestowed from on high. An energy influenced solely by emotion. Yes, yes. In this instance, negative ones set Akasha into motion thereby infusing the beasts with vitality. I posit this as the mechanism by which the beasts are born and sustained. Ah, do you still have that flower?
If we accept that it once shone bright by drawing upon Akasha, influenced by the thoughts of those nearby, then fear, terror, despair, negative emotions so powerful as to suffocate it, permeated the air in this place. You must be very careful. The forces which drive the final days may be beyond our ability to perceive. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you like that. At any rate, I will continue my research into Akasha. Do temper your expectations, however. There are sadly few detailed studies upon which I may draw. Formulating a new theory as you have is itself no small feat. I wish you well in your endeavors and pray you take care. Thank you. You stay safe as well, yes? Till next we meet, and we will meet again. So blasphemies now plague all the realm. It will only get worse if what Father said is true, as it did in Amarot. If that's our model, then shouldn't we expect the effects to grow more severe as it feeds off its own spread? As if people transforming into those monstrosities wasn't bad enough. If the flora and fauna, if the land itself turned against us, no one would survive. Here's your order, friend. May you find comfort in these dark times. Where do we go from here? If there's one thing we've learned, fighting blindly and simply reacting to what comes will accomplish nothing. We must find a solution that addresses the fundamental cause. Before our strength is exhausted, before this crisis spirals out of control. Is there something, anything we've overlooked? If there is an answer, Hydaelyn herself will have it. Twas she who bound Zodiac and forestalled the final days. Alas, we have heard naught from her since the Tower of Babel. Whether she cannot or will not speak, I can only speculate. Even the flower she gave us is no more. So advised the Watcher. But what could be the significance of that name? It is entirely unfamiliar to me. To me as well. It meant something to the ancients, though. In our time. Most surely. Yet I do not recall a single mention of it in the records of Anida. Another dead end. And quite literally. It's not as if there are any ancients living we could go and ask. Not alive as such, but not quite dead. Elidibus. I sealed him in the White Horus site of the Crystal Tower back on the first. Contained within that reservoir of ether that maintains it, 
ether that is returned little by little to the sea. Naught may remain of his soul. However, if part of it lingers, we might be able to speak with him there. I know we can no longer make that journey, but you, my friend, still can. Yes, we can but act and hope for the best. If nothing else, should we learn the first is safe, we'll have that much more reason to keep fighting the good fight. That said, the odds are not in our favor, to say the least. Which is why we're fortunate to have Uriange up there on the moon, working hard to make all the necessary preparations for our departure, should it come to it. And why we have nothing to lose by staying the course till the last instant. Indeed. To the last, let us all do what we can. I will consult with Master Matoya and see if she knows of a way to reach Hydaelyn from the Ethereal Sea. And I will visit the nation's leaders and attempt to ascertain how far the final days have progressed elsewhere. Keep me abreast of your findings. I can seek out and slay the worst of the immediate threats only to slow the spread. Unease, terror, despair. Try as we might to suppress them, these emotions will return to Harrius time and time again. But when they do, remember this. Your friends and loved ones are out there somewhere, sharing in your struggle. You are not alone. So ends the brief respite before the next revelation. Yes, so much left for you to see. Where beginning ends and end begins. Authentication complete. Please state your business. Acknowledged. Reinitializing Sitka's tower systems. Searching for Elidibus entity. located in subterranean core power accumulator projecting image my home my friends no more than a dream oh. You. Why have you awakened me? I no longer sense those places beyond. All Lord Zodiac. You must explain all.
So, he is fallen, and my brethren's souls returned to the star. The doom we sacrificed so much to prevent is come again. Old burdens now yours to bear. But if this is Van Daniel's design, then I, as Elidibus, have a duty to fulfill. Your unsolicited act has restored to me some few memories of the Convocation. Such knowledge as I have, I will share. I do this not for you. I merely perform my duty, as I have ever done. Where to begin? Ah, the end. Your understanding of what caused the final days is consistent with our own. The decay first took root where the currents were weakest. Yes, a conclusion drawn by him, Fan Daniel. Not the him of here and now, but as I knew him, long, long ago. Having shed light upon the phenomenon, he dedicated himself to devising a countermeasure. Were it not for his knowledge of the Celestial, we would never have made the connection, and thence forestalled the final days. And though he inherited that noble soul, how different this last incarnation, so consumed by self-loathing, and hate. Elpis. Yes, the name is familiar to me. Yet I know it not as a flower, but a place. A testing facility for determining which of our creations were fit to be released into the world. Many worked there, and before joining the Convocation and assuming the title of Fan Daniel, he was their chief. He was Hermes. That is all I know. The crystals tell little of the lives the Fourteen led prior to their induction. Elpis itself would tell even less. Nary a ruin has survived. Wait. I saw you there. In Elpis. No. I did not. But I did. I did. A lingering trace of impossibility. And a truth that fills my heart. My memories remain clouded, I fear. However, they have revealed to me one possible course. You must travel to Elpis, to the time when Hermes served as its chief. In glimpsing the Exarch's memories, not only did I make his summoning magic mine own, I also mastered the workings of this tower, which, having absorbed my empowered essence, now harbors an abundance of energy. As such, I believe I can deliver you unto the past, unto that place and that precise moment. Given the eons that must be traversed, the gateway will not be fully formed. 
Your form will be less tangible still than those warriors of light I had summoned. In all likelihood, none will be able to see or hear you. Yet even should you manage to interact with others, you will be unable to affect meaningful change. For the reality you wish to save, the reality to which you must return, exists as a result of the final days. You cannot reshape the past to undo the tragedies of the present. Cannot unmake the sorrow and suffering fated to come. In full knowledge of this, will you still entrust your life to your foe and make the journey? Very well. I shall cast you unto the river of time. Let this be my final act. You must input the commands. I no longer have the authority. First, you must reconfigure the systems, that the tower's ether may be channeled for the magic. The preparations are complete. The gateway will soon open. Return at once to the ocular. All appears to be in order. The ether flows unimpeded. The magic should consume every last moat of my essence. Why are you surprised? Did I not say that this will be my final act? Lord Zodiac is no more. There is nothing for me here. The ones I love and long to see again are waiting in that promised land beyond memory. And dream. Now go, warrior of light. Go and do not look back. Well, Heidelin. I take my leave of you. Yours is the mantle of the last of us. May you have the joy of it, the burden and the solitude. It falls to you now. You and your champion to save our star.
And here we are, Elpis. Well, well, how rare to receive you in person. To what do we owe the honor? Oh, just a few odd tasks. We'll be here a while. You're welcome to stay as long as you see fit, of course. As a matter of procedure, however, I must ask that you kindly remove your masks. Come now. Is this truly necessary? Surely you can tell who we are. Who you are, perhaps. But I am far less infamous. Regardless, if we do not follow protocol, it is our hosts who would be held accountable. So, please, do favor us with your handsome face. Satisfied? I thank you for your cooperation. You are free to go about your business. By the by, you see it too, yes? I haven't the foggiest what you're talking about. Hmm, that's odd. It's right here. A bit thin in the ether, but there's no mistaking it. The color of its soul is almost identical to Azem's. Do you suppose she created it? Rather unusual for a familiar to have a soul, though. Don't ask me. All I know is that it's trouble. Doubly so if it's her spitting image. So let's leave it be. Come now. Hmm. It's trying to say something. But it's literally too intangible to form words. Why don't you give it some ether? Spare a snifter of your bounteous reserves. do you take me for? Why, a dear friend, of course. One who wouldn't let acts of kindness, such as my accompanying him on errands to far-flung outposts, go unrewarded? I suggest you close your eyes, or this may be unpleasant. You may open your eyes. adjusted its size. The better to indulge your whim. This way, it will be easier to communicate. How very thoughtful of you. And may I applaud your artful reinforcement. 
Without further ado then. Greetings, I am Hithlidaeus, chief of the Bureau of the Architect. Sulking beside me is the most honorable Emmett Selk of the Convocation of Fourteen. And how might we address you, my new friend? A fine name. And I'm pleased to see you understand our words. So, tell us, whence have you come? The thinness of your essence suggests you weren't created here. You do not know? Or cannot say? Hmm. Allow me to ask a different question then. What brings you here? Well now, the same as us. Perhaps Azim wished to come too, but had to settle for a familiar. If she truly wished to be here, then she would be. Right you are. My apologies if we've given offense. The two of us can discern the color of souls, you see, and yours happens to resemble that of a friend. And with your purpose matching our own, besides, we jumped to a hasty conclusion. We are here to speak with Hermes, the chief overseer of this facility, which we also intend to tour in order to gain greater insight into the man's work. We, I say, though this is Emmett Selk's charge. I am here only to serve as his guide. And I should be happy to serve as yours as well, by way of an apology for the misunderstanding. Wait, are you suggesting that we bring it along on official business? This thing we know next to nothing about? If you harbor suspicions, better to keep it close than leave it to its own devices. Wouldn't you agree? Besides, having a mysterious life form in tow is the norm rather than the exception here. Welcome, my friends, to the testing ground of creation at Heaven's Edge, Elpis. What secrets are you hiding, I wonder? We're alike. 
different. I want to be... Wait, please, wait. Greetings and salutations. Can you hear me? Do not be alarmed. I mean you no harm. I wish only to hear your words, share your feelings and know your thoughts. May we please be friends? <laughs> May we please be friends? Ah, I see you found him. Hithlidaeus, it's been a while. Too long, I think. Too long indeed for close collaborators. On this blessed occasion, I bring not only myself, but others who long to speak with you. You are of the Convocation? Emmet Selk at your service. Do I have the honor of addressing Hermes, Chief Overseer of Elpis? You do. You have traveled far for it. Given your facility's purpose, its remote location is something of a necessity. Would that I didn't have to rely upon a guide. Oh, you wound me. Have I not ever been an attentive and helpful friend? But moving along to more agreeable company, this one we chance to... Well, you certainly have her attention. Is she one of yours, Hermes? Her name is Meteon. It means shooting star. Hmm. If I may make an observation, her ether is terribly thin. I fear she might dissipate at any moment. Nor do I believe you've made a submission to the Bureau. I would remember such a concept if you had. I haven't, as you say. I judged it too early. She's a pet project of mine, still undergoing preliminary testing. But rest assured that I will attend in person ere long. Very well. Being an authority on flying life forms, I appreciate that you are exacting in your work. I shall look forward to your submission. If we have finished with the perfunctory chit-chat, I would discuss official matters. By my coming, I trust you already anticipate the subject. I have an inkling, yes. Please wait to the main building yonder. I shall join you as soon as I've returned these creatures to their homes. What's wrong, Hermes? The Nemostoma is missing. Hmm. I may have found it. A creature with the self-same ether as those there, nestled in the boughs of a tree outside the grounds. You're saying they can climb with their sorry excuses for limbs? The fashion has been to imbue aquatic creatures with the power of flight ever since the words of Mitron created a sky-swimming fish. 
The Ambistomas too can fly, if only slightly, and they could conceivably climb a tree. Whether they can come down safely, however... Excuse me. supposed to do with this lot? <laughs> May I suggest we split up? If you would be so good as to assist Hermes, Emmett Selk and I shall keep an eye on these adorable creations in the meantime. This appears to be the place. And here is where we part ways. We will be discussing highly sensitive affairs. Only a select few may be privy to such knowledge, and that does not include someone who cannot or will not divulge their origins. What? Will I have to remove you by force? Yes, I'm sure your business with Hermes is quite pressing. You may speak with him to your heart's content after ours is concluded. I do not object to her attendance. Hermes, this is highly irregular. Perhaps, but I believe she can be trusted. Meteon would not have taken to her so quickly otherwise. Moreover, the presence of a third party may help me to maintain composure. As you wish, then. Behave yourself, do you hear? So, it's finally happened, then. I, Van Daniel has declared his intention to step down and named you as his preferred successor. In recognition of your knowledge and your works, the Convocation is giving the recommendation due consideration. As one who does not know you personally, I am to use my impartial eye to take your measure. And above all else, to ascertain your disposition towards the invitation. I understand that you and Van Daniel are close. He himself was once chief overseer of Elpis, after all. I should not be surprised if you knew before anyone else that he wished to relinquish his office. I did. He told me that when he fulfilled his purpose, he wished to pass the torch to me. A torch you seem none too pleased to accept. Are you so averse to serving on the Convocation? No, it's not that. For a humble researcher like myself to even be considered is an honor beyond words. No. What troubles me what I struggle to come to terms with is the very fact that Van Daniel is stepping down. Does this not mean that he will return to the star? Of his own volition, yes, like so many others have before him. 
return to the star? Does that mean... die? Well now, that's not a word I hear often. Is that what you say here in Elpis? Mankind is the life of a Theris. Each of us, a drop of blood flowing through its veins, bearing sustenance. In our finite time upon it, tis our duty to make it a better place, that all who call it home, now and in future, may abide in happiness. To that end, we have dedicated ourselves to the pursuit of enlightened creation. And by our efforts did we transform this once untamed wilderness into the peaceful paradise you enjoy today. To return to the star whence we came is a privilege afforded to we who have so loved and nurtured it. A choice embraced by those who have lived their lives to the fullest, in service to our world. And when they depart upon this journey, it is beautiful, always. The Fourteen are no exception. Tis believed no occasion is more felicitous than the fulfillment of one's duty. Our office becomes our lives, and to retire is to return, or so the majority of us hold. Some few have elected to eschew custom. Mayhap you feel Fan Daniel's deeds do not warrant his return. Yet you should know his accomplishments as well as any. During his time, he conceived of countless outstanding concepts. And channeling the wealth of experience he attained here in Elpis, he brought forth many new specimens. I know of all this. I do. It's just... I cannot fathom why someone so great and wise who could still do so much good, would want to end it all. Oh no, I've made her upset. Forgive me, I know I requested your presence. Might I trouble you to take me to an outside? A change of scenery would do her good. Amazing, is it not? The Ampelos, one of our newest subjects. So, how are we coming along? Product of Elpis, and so named for their birthplace. A happy accident, born of the hands of a former researcher who loved beautiful blossoms. Unique for how they change color, to reflect the emotional state of those nearby. Though be it here or elsewhere, they are seldom seen in any hue save purest white. Reflect the emotional state, you say? By what means do they achieve this? In creation, 
There exists an energy wholly apart from ether, one driven by emotions. In like manner to how we manipulate ether, this flower is subject to the influence of said energy. While it has no will of its own, it is sensitive to the prevailing emotion in the vicinity and reacts by altering its color and vibrancy. Akasha? Akasha? It is one of the unseen energies defined by Hanish alchemical theory. Though a gross oversimplification, some describe it as an essence influenced by feeling. Akasha, though I'm not familiar with the term, your description suggests it is the self-same energy. Dynamis, we call it. And those entities like the Elpis flower that have the ability to interact with this energy, converting emotions into tangible phenomena, are Antelekis. That's me! That's me! An Anteleki! That you are, my dear, and no ordinary one at that, but the first, possessed of free will. Wait, a form of energy other than ether? Dynamis? I've never heard of such a thing. Hardly surprising, Dynamis cannot be seen, much less felt. And though its existence has long been theorized, we had no proof until the flower's serendipitous creation. What's more, Dynamis is far weaker than ether. Under normal circumstances, its effects are drowned out by the latter. On account of which, beings comprised of and reliant upon the ether, like you and I, are unable to make practical use of Dynamis. Tis a truly esoteric thing known to but a select few scholars. Intriguing. Then, given the limitations you described, why create Neteon? Our star, Etheris, is especially rich in ether, so much so that its name is derived from it. However, when we consider all energy in existence here and in the vast space beyond, Dynamis may account for as much as 68.3%. The more abundant form by far. Were we able to control it, we could open the door to limitless possibilities. Tis not unlike a gently flowing stream, unable to break through the dam of ether barring its path. But if we could imbue the stream with the vigor of a raging river... Ah, not that I have such grand ambitions. Nay, I merely wish to create a being that could traverse the great expanse. The relative scarcity of ether beyond the bounds of this star was a concern. And so, I looked to another source of energy by necessity. That being Dynamis. No wonder her ether is so thin. Precisely. Yours is thin too. Like an Entelechi. Like me. So... Are we the same? Entelechis.
I think not. Your nature remains a mystery, but ere I reinforced you, you appeared to be little more than a common familiar, and a faded one at that. A deficit of ether alone does not an Enteleki make. It would, however, make it easier for you to interact with Dynamis. And limited though its influence may be, this quality could prove the difference between victory and defeat. You do well not to underestimate it. Oh dear. I'd forgotten about the poor fellow. You must excuse me a moment while I go and verify a few more things. No, no, you are not foisting this nonsense on me! I'm given to understand you have the power to help the Charybdis, and should be quite willing to do so. And so I appeal to your better nature, most benevolent Emmet Selk. Please teach her to fly. Or else Hermes will transform! Right now! Now, now, there's no need to go quite that far. Altruism is its own reward, as I'm sure he would agree. Oh, would he now? And who contrived to put me in this position, pray tell? Nothing so devious. I merely suggested a possible course of action. nursemaid to your creations. I thank you to remember this favour and let it be the last. I will aid it once it is taken to the air. It falls to you to shepherd it skyward. Well, let's relax and enjoy the spectacle, shall we? You were wondering why Emmett Selk joined the Convocation. Truth be told, he wasn't the first choice for the office. I was. On the strength of my ability to see Ether. But I declined the offer. For though my vision is exceptional, I am pedestrian in all other aspects. Worse even. Quite abysmal when it comes to manipulating Ether, for example. Couldn't transform even if I had a mind to do so. What good is the ability to perceive a problem if one cannot act to address it? Emmett Selk has no such shortcomings. He excels in vision and manipulation both, the latter to an extraordinary degree. If there is a mage more powerful, I do not know of them. Thus did I recommend him for the office in my stead. And I wasn't the only one. Far from it. Countless others vouched for his skill and character. People the world over, to whom he had previously lent a helping hand. <laughs> oh, how surprised he was. Claimed he hadn't done anything remarkable for anyone. Modest to a fault. He deserved every bit of acclaim he received. 
yet he may well have gone unappreciated were it not for a mutual friend. A singular soul who can't help but involve herself in the business of others. Where she walks, excitement is certain to follow. Her antics irritate Emmett Selk to no end. But much of his grumbling stems from genuine concern. When our friend calls, he never fails to answer and lend his talents. And in the course of doing so, he himself came to be recognized and respected by those around him. <laughs> they are truly remarkable individuals, and I'm proud to call them friends. To help them realize their dreams. This will be my greatest contribution to our world. And when they have fulfilled their respective purposes, so too shall I have fulfilled mine, and together we may return to the star. Look at me, spilling my innermost secrets. I can't seem to help it with you. I can only assume it is due to the color of your soul. I just don't understand how you can be so alike and yet so different. Ah, yes. I dare say the Charybdis will be fine here on. Why don't you go and signal to Emmett Selk? Let him know that his arduous task is at an end. for me. You've finished talking? Yes. We've come to a decision. My thanks for keeping me to your company. Emmett Selk and Hithledeus have already retired to their rooms. There is room for you too, if you would follow me. first. Elpis flowers? feel sad too. You're not alone. I see Mision has shared much with you. Talk a moment.
I do not think it wrong that we live for the star, that we strive to make it a better place. And yet, in carrying out my duties here, there are times when I am plagued by doubt. Do you recall what Hithlidaeus said when we first spoke of my nomination? Death is the privilege of those who have fulfilled their purpose, a choice they embrace of their own free will. And when they depart, it is always beautiful. Perhaps it is, but only for man. Creations that he deems useless are discarded with nary a second thought. Some scarcely born into the world, afforded a handful of breaths before life and potential are abruptly extinguished. We make an effort to spare them the pain, but they sense what awaits. Rage and anguish and cower and fear, and it is not beautiful. Yet no one cares, no one. So fixated are we upon the duty that we do not pause to question the method. Pain and suffering, confusion and despair, writ plain in the eyes of those poor creatures. Yet no one sees. We turn a blind eye and carry on in blissful ignorance. Not amiss, and always, always the blossoms shine pure and white. Contradiction so blatant I could scream, want to scream. How can you all accept this aberration? Then I wonder, am I the aberration for thinking thus? And I am filled with dread. But now I know I'm not alone. Not the only one for whom the flowers weep. I won't ask what you thought as you kneeled beside the Alpis, or if you only did it at Meteon's insistence. Nevertheless, I thank you. To know that you too have experienced suffering is a comfort. so willingly lend an ear to ease my burden. You are a strange one. The stars in the heavens. Know you what they are? Though it is too far to tell, each glittering light could be a world not unlike Aetheris. A world filled with life. So many stars, so many lives. For us, there may be no higher purpose than to live for our world. But what of the other living beings out there? What is it that gives their lives meaning? That drives them day after day after day? To pose that question to our undiscovered cousins, I created beings of dynamis, who can traverse the vast emptiness between the stars. Meteon and her sisters. I, sisters. She has a great many of them. And they have already departed on their journey, traveling to one star and then the next in search of life. As one might expect, exploration on such a grand scale is rife with difficulties, and thus far I've naught to show for it. But I have faith that we will make some manner of discovery ere long. And when we do, I should be glad to share our findings with you, in gratitude for your kindness. It's getting rather late. We had best find our beds. It would not do for both of us to be sleep-deprived on the morrow. Come, Meteon. 
Let us head back. All right. Forgive me. Please, forgive me. May you and your kin find peace. Wherever your souls may drift in the underworld, may you find tranquil seas. Be not forgotten, in concept endure, to reclaim form and one day live again. Serve not the star, or any purpose save your own. Live again, if that be your desire. If that be your want, we are worthy. But leave your suffering behind. Lay down your burdens, be born anew. Fly high, fly free. Join the Convocation, Hermes. You do not belong here. Leave to replace another. To be replaced. It changes nothing. Tell me, do you think it right that we sacrifice all these lives for the sake of the star? And when the star has reached perfection, what then? If all who are satisfied choose to die, shall we all die in satisfaction? I do not know. Were I to take up the seat of Van Daniel, it would be tantamount to approving my predecessor's death. I do not know if it is right and to be torn by such thoughts. I do not know if I am fit to represent mankind. Hermes! Please don't be angry. It hurts so. Forgive me. If you would still consider me in spite of everything, I beg some time to gather my thoughts. Meanwhile, Hithlidaeus, I fear I must trouble you to attend to the others. Tis no trouble at all. Take as long as you require. And you, my friend. I pray you find that which you seek. I expect we have some few matters to discuss. Shall we return to the Twelve Wonders for a time?
Aye. I present to you Kalamelios Zephyros. Here you will find a number of testing facilities, as well as the observation hub of Poiton Oikos. Right then. Let's begin by... Hmm. Well, well. An Araeus. How delightful. And what, pray tell, is that? Ah, that's a new species of shark. We approved the concept but a few days ago. Sharks are among the most popular sea creatures. Rare is the day when someone does not submit a new concept. At first, they were largely orthodox. Consideration given to such things as size and environmental impact and then a whimsical someone thought to bestow it with flight, another superior intelligence. And then the floodgates burst, concepts with multiple heads or arms or legs or arms and legs, and so on and so forth. It was getting absurd. A part of me wanted to tell them to go away and find something else to create, but in the end, I couldn't deny their passion. <sighs> Here we are. That was too close. Are you unharmed? Well now, if it isn't a pair of familiar faces. Banar, that we should meet you here. As I mentioned earlier, the better part of the Convocation holds that when we retire is when we return to the star. Well, she is not among said majority. Even after stepping down, she carries on with her work. Venar is her name, and she is the previous Azim. It has been a while, Hithlodeus. You look well. Less so, Emmet Selk. I dare say the lines upon your brow have both deepened and doubled in number. A shame for one so young. You must make an effort to frown less often. Easier said than done, thanks to your unruly successor. How is she, if I may ask? incorrigible as ever. Rushed headlong into a volcano on the brink of eruption just the other day. I should be glad to share the tale in its entirety later, if you're so inclined. Ha! Oh, you know I am. Now then, you are? chance come from the future. I do not believe we have ever met, yet I sense my magic upon you. Therefore, if I wove the enchantment, I could only have done so at a later point in time. Hmm. 
What manner of magic is this, if I may ask? A traveler's ward, of course. It prevents the corruption of one's ether. I see you are not ignorant to its presence. And while there are many protective spells, the one you bear is unmistakably mine. Hold on. From the future? That's absurd. What is it? Are you unable to speak of the matter? The reality to which you must return exists as a result of the final days. You cannot reshape the past to undo the tragedies of the present. So... Your actions here will not change your history, but they may yet affect the course of ours. How very exciting! I'm quite fond of delving into the unknown, and there's naught more unknown than the future. Until a moment finally arrives, we cannot know for certain what will come to pass. Regardless of our supposed foreknowledge, so you needn't worry for us. More importantly, that you should go to such great lengths as to travel unto the past bespeaks the gravity of your quest. Will you not reveal it to us? Mayhap we can be of aid to your cause. If this is true, then you've been keeping quite the secret to yourself. As a representative of the Convocation, I will hear it all. Your identity, purpose, everything. Why don't we move to a place more conducive to calm conversation? I've been working here for some days now at an old friend's behest. If it is agreeable, we may make use of my accommodation at Poiton Oikos. We were meant to meet. I am certain of it. Else I wouldn't have marked you so clearly and sent you unto myself in the past. It's precisely the sort of mischief I would get up to, and quite inspired, if I do say so myself. Wonderful aroma. I feel more relaxed already. Would that I had sweetmeats to offer, but I travel light out of habit. There's plenty of hot water though, so please have as much tea as you like. Now then, will you tell us your tale?
Why don't you start from the beginning? Preposterous! Utterly preposterous! While not the words I would have chosen, I too have my doubts. Much of it borders on the incredulous. What of you, Vanar? Not knowing the precise details of the first final days, it is difficult to determine the veracity of the tale. Supposing it is all true, I must ask myself why I would do what I did. Why would I feel I had no recourse but to oppose the Fourteen and create this Hydaelyn? Circumstances change, of course, but it would not have been an easy decision regardless. No, there must have been a reason. One compelling enough to force me to take such drastic measures. Then there is the Elpis flower, which I said would serve as a guide. That it's of import to your mission is plain, but your presence here leads me to believe that this place also holds significance. But what could it be? What are we meant to accomplish? Might it not be simply thus? In the future, whence she came, the final days could not be averted. Mankind has no choice but to flee the star. By alerting us to that eventuality, perhaps you wish to pave the way for other futures. Theoretically speaking, it is a possibility. Yet if that were my primary objective, I see no reason to guide our friend to Elpis specifically. The capital and Amorot, or even my own home, would be more logical destinations. True, true. I note also that Heidelin did not specify a point in time to which she must return. By this, it may be inferred that it was not critical that we should meet. Alternately, she had reason to believe that our paths would converge, coincidental though it may seem. Hmm... This is quite a puzzle. And we do not have all the pieces. Hardly any. But we do have one immutable fact. If the final days are indeed as described, they will bring death to all that I hold dear. Yet despite being afforded long years of preparation, the only provisions I could make were... for flight. Nay, my first and foremost endeavor would be to find a way to forestall the coming doom. Given that even the Fourteen failed, Mayhap you deemed it impossible. 
Nothing is impossible. This I have always believed. And if Heidelin is indeed me, she would believe the same. Listen to yourself. Are you seriously entertaining the notion that you are a messianic figure in some far-fetched tale? Well, I will not. I refuse to accept that our world could be undone by some unforeseen calamity. I also take offense to my portrayal as a megalomaniacal madman. To sacrifice oneself for the star is a noble act, and I would hold those who gave themselves to this zodiac in the highest esteem. Yet, you claim I recreated Amarot and populated it with phantoms of our people? A bizarre indulgence that would be insulting to their memory. Worse still, I even invited you there. Literally invited my own downfall. Why would I do something so idiotic and inexplicable? Now, I will allow that the hypothetical task of restoring our world would be daunting in the extreme. The thought of having to bear such a burden for a thousand, thousand lives horrifies me. But I would never forsake my duty. I would never forsake my brethren. You do not know me. I've had my fill of your fiction. I will return to my duty, and you will not bother me again. Emmett Selk! Wait! You've seen much of Elpis already. If you have any observations to share, I should like to hear them. The energy distinct from ether. Though not my field, I have a basic understanding of dynamis. And you say Hermes researched the phenomenon in the course of creating Meteon? Yes. I believe this warrants further investigation. With that settled, it is time for action. The missing pieces of the puzzle are here, I'm certain of it. And when you find them, the picture my future self has painted will be complete, and you will have your answer. And suffice it to say, I will aid you in your quest. Selk is the man Azum described to me. We've not seen the last of him. breeze and a breathtaking view. What is it like in the future? Is the world still a beautiful place?
<laughs> I swear I could hear the glimmer in your eyes and the adoration in your voice. While we wait, will you not tell me about your adventures? Well, not the portentous events which led you here, but the simple delights all your own. By learning about the future world, I may gain insight into future me's plans. But more than that, I have an interest simply as a fellow traveler. Short of going somewhere oneself, there's naught more stirring than hearing another's account. Incredible. <laughs> Would that I could have been there to see it. <sighs> Yours is a harsh and unforgiving world. Yet in spite of this, your brethren hold fast to their virtue. To know that the light of mankind's potential still shines, even in that faraway place, it gives me heart. Thank you for regaling me with your tales. I will treasure every word. As you know, I was once a scholar. And among other things, I sought to understand the workings of the world. What exactly is ether? How formed the laws of nature? When sprung mankind? Riddles and mysteries beyond counting. Over the years, I have managed to find answers to some few of them. Yet rather than attain a sense of mastery, the more I understood, the more I came to hold the world and its miracles in awe. We too are miracles, each and every one of us, born of the warm breath of life that traverses the heavens, swirling through eternity. When I fully grasped the improbability of our existence, nothing felt impossible anymore. If it could be imagined, it could be done. A passion swelled within me, an epiphany dispelling all preconceptions of what was natural and true, and a presence without, immense yet intimate. Fate, perhaps, holding us in its tender embrace. As reassuring as it was intimidating, how keenly aware I became of creation's fragility, built as it is upon precarious happenstance. I was overcome with an irrepressible urge to know the world more intimately, to hear its voice, feel its breath, I ventured forth on a journey that very day, so very long ago now. Freed from presumption and prejudice, I saw the world through a newborn's eyes. Everything fresh and new, and so, so beautiful. Lands that stretched on forever. Skies one could drown in, the heartbeat of nature, silent yet strong. And amidst it all a people, beacons of light and life, laughter that warmed my heart like naught else before. They are my meaning, and my purpose, my love. 
And so long as they need help, I cannot return to the star. Perhaps my future self is still waiting for it. A moment she can let go and walk unto the end. Safe in the knowledge that man will find his own way. You, who are our future, tell me this, and tell me true. Has your journey been good? Has it been worthwhile? Pray forgive my lateness. My observation subject was rather irritable, and it took a while to settle it down. No need to apologize. Your work takes precedence. Besides, we had a pleasant conversation in the meantime. You're too kind. Now then, I'm told you wished to ask me some questions. Indeed. I've an interest in one of Hermes' creations. Meteon. You witnessed a host of them take flight, yes? Oh, that! Yes, yes, I did. It was in the dark of the morn. I'd left the Thalassi after nocturnal observation. As I walked along, I spied a bright light climbing high into the southeastern skies. Then, in an instant, it was gone. Like a shooting star, only rising rather than falling. But then another shot up, then another, and another. Intrigued, I made my way to the edge to investigate. And who should I spy on an isle to the south but Hermes and Meteon, the Matea, rather? There were lots of them, and I realized they must be the shooting stars that I'd seen. A dazzling spectacle indeed. Have you spoken with Hermes about this? Oh, yes. The sight left such an impression on me that I approached him about his mystery project the very next day. Alas, he said that he couldn't reveal anything just yet, that he needed to conduct further tests. <laughs> it shouldn't be long now, though. He often returns to that isle, and I have a feeling he's nearing a breakthrough. Splendid. We are likewise eager for the details. Well, that is all we wish to ask. Thank you for taking the time to indulge our curiosity. You're very welcome. It's always a pleasure to speak with other inquisitive souls. Oh, and will you be descending now? If so, I shall link the doors for you. Please. was my intent to finish it, but clearly I underestimated you. One would think I never learn. I made the same mistake with Asm when we first sparred. Despite being less than half my age, her strength was astounding. As is yours. Tis plain you have weathered considerable hardship. Far more even than your tales would suggest. It seems we have both learned much on our journeys. Well now. 
dare say he has warmed to you. A boon to be sure. He never forgets his favorites and is ever eager to come to their aid. Quite a small place, lacking even the most basic equipment. The present may yield no clues, but we may yet try perusing the past. Have you done this before? So you cannot control the power freely. Worry not. I shall assist you. Come and stand before me. There are two ways to see the past. The first entails peering through the walls of the soul in the moment a subject is recalling a memory. The second requires no subject and is instead a process of piecing together an event from ripples left in the ambient ether. As memories are etched upon the ether of the soul, so too are they etched upon the ether of the world. In this way can history be preserved. Such memories are given to fading, however, and can prove challenging to visit. But come, let us try. Close your eyes. All units fully functional and proceeding on course towards their respective stars. Estimated time to completion of survey is 108 cycles. End of status report. Severing connection with shared consciousness. Did you hear that, Hermes? All is well. <sighs> yes. Good tidings at long last. Every step of the way, I've been reminded how little we understand creation. How the universe defies imagination. But soon we won't need to... speculate. We'll know the answers. What others live for. <laughs> Indeed. And we'll owe it all to you and your sisters. What answers we will get? Whatever intelligent beings that exist out there are bound to be vastly different from us. Diverse in form and culture. Possessed of unique ways of thinking. Their conception of life and its purpose will be no exception. Completely and utterly unlike ours. I have no idea. Yet whatever answers we receive, I will not dismiss them out of hand. No, I will think earnestly on them all. And I will share them with our people, that together we may contemplate our own existence. Perhaps then our star will become a better place. Not only for man, but for all life. Meteon, though I gave you wings to soar the heavens, I did not teach you how to walk the earth. So loath was I to bind another living being. In the course of your long journey, you will learn from those you meet, 
learn to walk and run and so much more. And when you return, older and wiser, we will have a celebration to mark your homecoming and coming of age both. Will there be apples covered in syrup? <laughs> and how are you supposed to eat them? Hmm. Rather than food, perhaps... A flower. Yes. Upon your return, I will gift you a beautiful flower. So, what is your opinion? I am inclined to agree. As we had suspected, the two are somehow involved. Yet it's difficult to believe that they would deliberately seek to end all life. In light of this, I propose that we reveal your tale to Hermes himself. If he does not wish for the final days as we believe, he may well join us in pursuing a solution. Then it is settled. Let us seek out our friend with all swiftness. It would not do to let such a pure soul be blackened by tragedy. My apologies for keeping you waiting. I understand there is a matter you wish to discuss. Aye. A matter of the utmost gravity. If one can suspend disbelief. Go on then. Tell him what you told us. Who you are, and why you came. Final days. The phenomena observed during these star-encompassing calamities is likely the product of a dynamous reaction. And none is more versed in the applications of this energy than you, Hermes. I must stress, that we do not believe you would desire such destruction. We come not to lodge accusations, but to beg your wisdom. And so, distressing though the exercise may be, I ask that you share with us your opinion on the matter, on the assumption that our visitor's tale is true. Even you, Vena. As you say, the phenomena observed in the two calamities may both be attributed to Dynamis. Of note is the difference in its effect. In the first final days, it warped creation magics. In the second, it warped the people themselves. The key variable, I suspect, is the etheric density of the men of each age. As you know, ether, in essence, negates dynamis. Harboring high concentrations of ether, we ancients cannot readily manipulate dynamis, nor be manipulated by it. 
Therefore, rather than ourselves, the calamity affected our magics. In contrast, having been sundered, the people of the future are composed of but a fraction of our ether. Thus are they susceptible to the influence of Dynamis and its transformative potential. But that would explain only the mechanism, not the cause. Though perhaps... What is it? Even should it be a hypothesis, we would hear it. Dynamis is an energy put in motion by feelings. Feelings for which there must first exist a source. A source to which the victims must be attuned. One that harbors the self-same negative emotions. Elsewise, it could not be the agent of such extreme change. So it wasn't the stagnation of the celestial currents. Someone, or something, is instigating the star's demise. So, we've a villain on our hands after all. Any idea who or what it could be? The celestial currents comprise the outermost layer of the star's ether, encasing it like a protective sphere. According to your tale, it was where the currents were weakest that the phenomena first manifested. If the inciting factor came from without a theris, then its effects would first be seen in those locations. Greetings. Can you hear me? Do not be alarmed. I mean you no harm. I wish only to hear your words, share your feelings, know your thoughts. May we please be friends. Meteon. What is it? Executing scheduled task, suspending individual self and connecting to shared consciousness. Connection established. Commencing status report. Meteon. Steady. So scared. So lonely. The pain. It's too much. <laughs> Why? Why? Uh, why do we... Uh, hurt. Hurt. Hate. This is wrong. She's... gone? But how? She has altered her etheric density in order to blend in with her surroundings, an ability for avoiding confrontation. Most effective. Frustratingly so. I can't see her either. Not even a trace. Stay away. Please. This is wrong. My mistake. So please. Are you all right? In your mind? No. We only heard her speak the instant before she vanished. Of course. When communicating without words, Meteon also employs Dynamis. That will explain why you were able to hear her, 
when we could not. Then you are our best chance of finding her. Follow her voice and try to track her down. Hindered though we may be, let us split up and search as well. Give chase. We shall herd her into the shelter. Please, Mizio. We must speak. I'm sorry, Hermes. I'm so sorry. can hear these words, then please. Please protect them. Protect them all. Individual self-suspended. Connection with shared consciousness stable. Our survey is complete. We shall now report our findings. All units safely arrived at their respective destinations. Seeking answers to Hermes' question, we attempted to make contact with the intelligent denizens of each star. Results are as follows, in order of numerical code. Traces of civilization found. Structures believed to have served as domiciles. No extant life forms detected. Dio. Ruined remnants of buildings scattered across star, surface of which is encased in ice. Presence of life could not be verified. Tria. Evidence of large population centers, akin to cities recovered. No extant life forms found, only their lingering essence. Tessera. Edifices surmised to be abandoned residences found. No extant life forms detected. Deadly plague or extreme environmental degradation likely to have led to mass extinction. They are all. Octo. Star found in state of violent conflict. Contact successfully made with inhabitants. But deployment of weapons of mass destruction resulted in total annihilation of local population shortly thereafter. Inea. Star is a barren desert. 
no identifiable flora found. Bones of living beings resembling men discovered beneath sands, but determination regarding their intelligence inconclusive. Remind me, Hermes, what exactly was the question you entrusted to Meteon? I tasked her with asking what others live for, what gives their lives meaning. Did you consider what may happen if the premise of the question is flawed? To be able to answer it, one must be living and desire to continue doing so. But if Meteon finds no living beings in the course of her journey, or none who desire to live, what then? What answers would she derive from their silence? <sighs> Meteon, enough! Suspend your mission and return hither at once. Decapente. Local civilization once flourished under auspices of higher power. Said power later laid waste to civilization in fit of rage. Upon revealing this to me, Entity elected to self-terminate in lieu of providing answer to question. No other intelligent life forms found. Turning a deaf ear, are we? We are taking Meteon back to Amarot. As I understand, we will need her if we are to bring back all of her sisters. It, yes. Meteon. It isn't right, is it? It isn't right to turn away from the answer. Even if the answer... is pain. Even if we aberrations must scream ourselves hoarse to be heard. I, whatever answers we find, I will not dismiss them out of hand. These words I said to you, and I will hold myself to them. What is the meaning of this? You, you cannot, cannot take Meteor. Not until, until she has finished her report. All else must wait. It's over, Hermes. In the name of the Convocation, I hereby take Meteon into custody. 
and setting aside the matter of your nomination, you will come with us too. We require your knowledge to assess and resolve the situation. <clears throat> Meteon, I am so sorry. With that, I could have listened to your report in full. Reflected upon its meaning and conveyed it to others. That they might reconsider their chosen course. But I have failed. And that wish will never be realized. However, ere our fates become the province of others, I bid you tell me just one thing. Was there happiness in those distant stars? Was there a reason for living? We conducted our search as per your instructions. We scoured historical records, communed with the spirits of the deceased. Heard the final testaments of the dying. Welcomed their shadowed hearts into our own. One race had striven to create a world bereft of animosity. They renounced relationships to avoid interpersonal strife. And in so doing, brought about societal collapse. One race had renounced war and devoted itself to the enrichment of its people. They were conquered. Though they destroyed the enemy in reprisal, they could not regain their former glory. One race had concluded that finite time was the root of all woes. Aspiring to shatter its shackles, they went in search of infinity. They discovered nothing is infinite, and that neither time or death can be cheated. Disillusioned, they gave up on the future, and themselves. One race had discarded all things that gave rise to sorrow, hoping to have only joy. They found joy lost its savor in the absence of sorrow and lost their will to live. The worlds apart, these peoples shared a belief. The belief that they had tried their best. That they had tried to fulfill their potential with every step and success. In the course of which, they learned the truth. That they would never be free of fear and sorrow, anger and despair, of loneliness, so long as they yet lived. Even now, their souls cry out for oblivion. And to this song of anguish, I lend my voice. We lend our voice. Oh, beloved mankind, shimmering jewels of beautiful Atheris, rejoice, for we will free you from the cruel yoke of existence. There is no need to struggle in vain. For in nihility awaits salvation. You will know peace and serenity. And it will be beautiful. We will make our nest at the edge of the universe. A 
And there, in the dark of dead worlds, hoard sorrow and suffering. There we will sing, our chorus ever louder and ever clearer, that our song may reach even this ether-shrouded star. Such is the answer we have found in the stars. Such is the gift we now offer to a fairies. Who are you to decide our fate? To decree we live or die? Lost your mind? You heard what she said. She means to destroy us all, yet you'd still take her side? In the name of the star, we have discarded those creations that we deemed flawed. If we ourselves are flawed, it does not stand to reason that we too should be discarded. That is sophistry, and you know it! Perhaps it is. Perhaps I am wrong. But who is to say that you are right? Let us settle this with a determination. In my authority, as Chief Overseer of Elpis, I will make a judgment on man's fitness to exist. If he can learn to value all life and retain his will to live, even should his end be justified, he will surely find a way to avert his demise. If not, he will perish from the star. As with all determinations, provisions must be made to ensure fairness. Kairos, awaken! Memory reconfiguration system Kairos activated. Awaiting instruction. Command, universal memory alteration. Target area, Catesis Hyperborea. Starting point. Arrival of Emmett Selk, of the Convocation at Propylion. End point. The present. Erase the memories of all events, and replace with a vague recollection of the following. I was here. Preparing to demonstrate the functionality of Kairos to Emmet Selk and Hithidaeus. Meteon's shared consciousness became unstable. She and her sisters could not sustain their existence, and all dissipated the burst. The resultant shockwave accidentally triggered Kairos which erased several days of memories from all present. Execute. Command acknowledged. Initializing. Three processes remaining to execution. Bravo. I dare say one would be hard-pressed to make it fairer. Everything that you told us Everything that has happened, the fact we've even met, it will all be gone. Go, Meteor, to the edge of the universe, where none can reach you. Hermes, won't you come with me? 
If you were to shed your flesh, I should be able to carry you. <sighs> I will remain. As a man, I will oppose the oblivion you bring. Silly fool. Had you said yes, I would have granted you the gentlest end. This ends here! That is far enough, Hermes! Argos, to me! First process complete. Two remaining to execution of memory reconfiguration. As if we needed more pressure. No matter what, you cannot forget what happened today. For it is the key to saving your future. Your world. This fight is our fight. What comes after, our problem to contend with. Not yours. No. Your own struggle awaits. And no one else can take your place. You must flee this place with your memories in time, And I will see that you do. Now then, where is it? There you are, my little confluence. Meteon's gotten away. Second process complete. One remaining to execution. No. No time for brooding. Listen well. Beyond lies a spatial confluence that connects the interior sections of this building. I will destroy the confluence and force open a way outside. When I do, you must jump through. I cannot tell you how sorry I am. But neither can I let you escape! Too brave by half. Exemplary work, as always, Emmett Selk. What? But how? I thought the confluence was... over... Over there? Yes. We were rather hoping you would. It was never anywhere but where it is now. 
The instant those two began making their way towards nothing, t'was clear the plan was a diversion. I'm quite incapable of destroying a confluence, I must confess. A gambit brazen beyond words. Though we've grown accustomed to reckless improvision due to the antics of an incorrigible associate. Though, in the case of certain present company, incorrigible is an understatement. Honestly, I'm beginning to suspect it's a requirement for every asset. There's no time! Quickly! Even now, I do not believe your tale. I would not suffer us to walk such a wretched path. Still, if it must be said, do not squander it, the legacy I leave you. Final process complete. Executing universal memory alteration. I'm fine. Just a little tired. Can it be true? Are we the only ones left who see beauty in the world? In life? Are the stars above no more than husks of fallen civilizations? She is unimaginably distant. I feel Meteon's presence and the place where to we must go. Ere she made good her escape, I placed an enchantment upon her, one which allows us to follow her trail. She has already left the outermost bounds of Atheris and continues on her way. Given the vastness of the universe, it will still be no easy feat to track her down. But thanks to Emmet Selk and his Ladeus, all is not lost. We remember. So long as we remember, our fates remain ours to shape. should still be. Given the likely state of their memories, however, it would be imprudent for us to approach them directly. In which case... I am sorry, my friend. I've asked much of you this day. But may I trouble you one last time? Argos will investigate in our stead. We will share in his consciousness 
and see and hear as if we were with him. Now, close your eyes and open your mind. You are unharmed. Unharmed? There is a gaping hole in my memories. I can scarcely remember arriving here in Elpis. Forgive me. I was preparing to demonstrate the functionality of Kairos to our guests. But Meteon, her shared consciousness became unstable and she she so that's what prompted the state of alert and when you went to investigate you were caught in Kairos's accidental operation so it would seem it's all a blur to me such an unfortunate accident Oh, and what of Vena and your other companion? You went inside together, as I recall. We did? If Vena was with us, I have no recollection of it. But that there is her familiar, is it not? The fellow seems happy enough, so I think it's safe to assume his mistress is well. I haven't the slightest notion who this other companion might be, however. Ah, well, that individual struck me as a bit different, for want of a better word. Perhaps it wasn't actually a person, but some manner of creation. Curious. I must ask Vinar about it when next we meet. Yes, yes, you do that. Now, if we may tend to Hermes, whatever this Meteon did, it seems he bore the brunt of it. Once you are fit to travel, you will return with us to Amarot. We need to make certain there are no other ill effects. Also, I am here on business of the Fourteen. We've already had the conversation, like as not, but since your toy wiped my memory, we'll have to have it again. Yes, of course, as you see fit. This Kairos, it manipulates memories through the emission of etheric waves, correct? There is a theory which holds that memories scoured by blasts of ether are restored when the soul is cleansed in the underworld. If true, then perhaps when our time comes to return to the star, we shall remember these few days we have lost. I doubt aught of interest occurred. Look forward to the revelation if you like, but I should prefer to reminisce on more meaningful moments. Let us rest, if only for a while. After all, you and I, oh, we still have a long, long way to go.